Uh, so we're going to get started. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to Tech Talk Tuesday. Tech Talk Tuesday is when we'll usually invite a speaker from outside of Pivotal or from inside Pivotal to give a talk about something that's interesting to us. Uh, so today we've invited my friend Amitai Ben Noon, who has a really awesome story. Uh, Amitai is uh, an ex-physicist, used to be a physicist, uh, that got really into policy on uh, specifically dr driverless cars, but also there was another thing you said. An energy policy. He'll talk about himself. Good. Okay, cool. Uh, so energy policy. Uh, worked in D.C. for a while, working for senator, a senator and for a couple of, uh, I don't know what they do down there, the government. And then <laughs> worked for a consultancy for a bit and is now the director of a driverless car think tank uh, down there. So he is going to talk to us about policy and all sorts of fun and interesting things. So I will hand it off to you. Having me and thanks a lot for coming. Um, are we, why? I think I'm good. I, I'm going to try to figure out how to make this full screen in a second, but I'll say a few words about about myself and then we'll get into the presentation. So uh, my name is Amitai Benun, and my title is I'm the director of Auton the Autonomous Vehicle Initiative at Safe, or Securing America's Future Energy, and that is a DC uh, advocacy organization for energy security. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment. Um, and let me just tell, fill you in a little bit about my background, how I came to there. So uh, I finished a PhD in physics about five years ago, and I was thinking about what to do next, so, and considering a few different options, and I became very interested in something called the AAAS Fellowship. That's uh, AAAS is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They publish Science Magazine, so you may have heard of them through, through that. But they also run a program which brings in 150 scientists every year to Washington, D.C., and embeds them within the government. And this has a twofold process. It, it really is about enabling the flow of information from the scientific establishment to the, to the government and vice versa. So you embed scientists into the government. This improves decision making and the evaluation of evidence and evidence-based policy at all levels of the government. And it also helps. Louder. Great. Um, and it also helps uh, the scientific establishment understand the government better. So I spent about a year and a half at the Department of Energy, where I was working to synchronize the United States uh, renewable energy portfolio. This was during the first Obama administration's first term, and renewable energy was a very big portfolio. And uh, I spent a lot of time working with the vehicles program, which was very interested in that point in battery vehicles and electric vehicles. And it was around that time I started to get interested in autonomous vehicles. Uh, it was still pretty early, in the pretty early stages of autonomous vehicles. People mostly thought that they were technology way off in the future. And uh, when I went to my superiors at the Department of Energy to talk to them about, hey, we need to look, think about how autonomous vehicles impact energy, they didn't take that very seriously at the time. Um, I then spent some time working on similar issues on uh, R&D policy for a senator for a year, and then I spent the last two years consulting for the auto industry, and for the last six months I've been working for SAFE, or Securing America's Future Energy. So the raison d'etre of SAFE is to, now let me try to get this full screen. Um, top right? There we go. Thanks. Okay, this just should, yeah, this. That should be good enough. Yeah. Okay, we're good. This is good enough. Great. So the reason that tariff safe is to improve United States energy security, uh, national security, and economic security through the reduction of petroleum consumption in the transportation sector. And this has a very specific national security focus uh, as opposed to an environmental focus as opposed to, let's say, an environmental focus. There are many people who want to reduce the use of petroleum in transportation because that's, that's important for, for the environment. There are many organizations that advocate for that in Washington, in, in Washington D.C. And I think part of the reason, part of what makes us effective uh, is our ability to really speak to issues from a national security perspective. And in particular, and, and I'll talk a little bit about our leadership in a second. I think it's really reflective of that particular mission as opposed to an environmental mission. So this is the reason why there is a particular problem that we're trying to address. You see, this is the, 
the, the vision of energy, energy sources as it's applied to several different uh, parts of our economy. So as you see, the commercial, residential, and industrial sectors of our economy are highly diversified in their dependence on different energy sources, whereas our transportation sector is really not diverse. It's 93% dependent on petroleum. And it's actually even more than that because the little green sliver you see on the top of the petroleum, of the transportation sector, is mostly biofuels, which are tied economically into market mechanisms to the price of oil. So you actually don't get a diversification from that se segment. So, but at the very minimum, just really on purely petroleum, we're 93 dependent uh, in the transportation sector. And if you look at the projections that are done by the US, official US uh, government uh, Energy Information Administration, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. That's going to change anytime soon. These are the projections over the next 15 years, and you see domestically the oil dependence of the transportation sector is going to only decrease from 93 to 90 percent. I think a big part, a big, we think that a huge part of the story in changing this is promote, the promotion of electric vehicles, and uh, we've been involved in many of the policy initiatives to help promote the adoption of electric, of, of electric vehicles. We run two deployment communities. Our sister organization runs two deployment communities, one in Colorado, one in Orlando. Um, we've been active in help pushing the United States towards more f efficient fuel standards for vehicles, as well as electric vehicle tax credits. And part of the reason we think, we think that this will work is if you look at, you look at not only is oil cheaper, is electricity cheaper than other sources of fuel, but it's decoupled economically from the oil market, and therefore it's not subject to the price volatility. It's not just that it's not just that there's an economic drag on um, an economic drag on from high prices, but the volatility itself imposes a cost. And elec electricity and electric vehicles help you help you get around that, insulate the economy, and and uh, improve national security. So. These are the two leaders of our, of our organization, the two chairmen of the board. On the left, that's Fred Smith. He's the CEO of FedEx. And as he happens to be former military, but he also, uh, as someone who's spent the last uh, most of his life working in the logistics industry, he's very, very acutely aware and very sensitive to the impact uh, that oil prices have on the economy. On the right, that's Admiral James T. Conway. He, until recently, was the 34th Commandant of the Marines, so he helped lead the, he helped lead the Marines in Iraq. And uh, so he's one of the chairman of our board, and we speak, uh, he sp like, we, when we, our positions are really his positions. Uh, so when we go to Capitol Hill and tell legislators, uh, when he goes to Capitol Hill and tells legislators that we need to in impact, in enact policies that ena enable more fuel diversity and transportation, and there needs to be more electric vehicles, it comes with a certain gravitas and a certain authority, and it comes from, it's, ne it's very different than coming in from, a, from a, let's say, an environmental perspective. This uh, brings, a, brings a, a voice that is credible, uh, very credible across party lines, and, you know, Boston and Cambridge is pretty far from Washington, D.C., but I imagine you might be aware that there is a lot of partisan gridlock and not a lot is getting done in Washington right now. And part of the reason is, is the stark divide between the Republicans and, and Democrats. And being able to talk to issues from a national security point of view is really important in being able to try to unify, and try to unify parties and get to a common ground where action can be taken. So I think this is where one of the only organizations that is doing something like this, and it really helps us become more effective. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the oil market, but really then we'll get to the main event, which is autonomous vehicles, where we are, and uh, what we think of it from a policy point of view. So. Um, as you know, the price of oil is now once again below $40. At one point, it was above $160. And uh, this time, we have a strong suspicion that this is intentional. And that uh, there are certain geopolitical considerations for countries like Saudi Arabia to turn out the spigot, to pour out oil, and to produce oil prices. And you know, until, until recently, often the, often the collusion and the decision making in OPEC has been to limit supply and raise prices. However, it seems right now the dynamic in the oil market and doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon is to increase supply and reduce prices. Well, why would they do that? Well, this is a graph of what expenditures have been on new on for oil companies looking for new sources. And you've seen as the oil prices come down in late 2015, the expenditures have dropped out. And 
one of the biggest threats to the to the oil to the oil suppliers uh, to OPEC and the many Middle Eastern countries and many Middle Eastern and South American countries is the domestic supply of U.S. oil, and that happens when companies go ahead and find find new wells. And as you see, as prices go down, it's very hard for these companies and wells to stay afloat and stay in business. And, um, and they tend to go out of business. There's a lot of bankruptcies in the fracking and oil exploration industry in North America. And this is partially the result of the low oil prices, which are maybe very much part of, of the Saudi strategy. This also seems to impact. This is a the dark red line is a the number of sales of electric vehicles over time. As you see, it really started to increase in early 2011 as these vehicles became commercially available. And they started to level off in the last year. And they're actually down in 2016. And this is, again, because when oil is it's much easier to make a sell of electric vehicle when, oil is, when gas is $5 a gallon as opposed to when gas is $2 a gallon. And even if the economics makes sense, it turns out that the average customer has a two to three year window for their decision making. They think about they're going to own a car for three years. Are they going to make back the extra cost of an electric vehicle in three years? And if the, even if on the, long ter on the longer term an electric vehicle makes sense, they seem to be unlikely to do so. And when you look at the, this is the average fuel economy of the entire U.S. fleet based on sales. And as you see, so the Obama administration put in new standards that forced the industry to step this up. And as you see, from 28, 2008 to 2014, every year there's been a stepwise, stepwise increase in the efficiency of vehicles sold. And as oil prices have gone down, you see month by month the efficiency, the average efficiency of the vehicles has gone down. And uh, again, it's worse this year because this year it turned out that there's been a strong increase in the proportion of, tr in the ratio of trucks versus cars sold. As oil prices get cheaper and gas prices get cheaper, people tend to buy more Ford F-150 pickup trucks and less, uh, you, know, che you know, Chevy, you know, le less Toyota Corollas, which are smaller and more fuel efficient. So we think there that um, we're very worried. So that we're very worried about the future of as is the future of electric vehicles. You know, we hope that over the next couple, we know that over the next couple of years, prices of the batteries will come down, and that will help. Um, but right now, we are looking at other directions in terms of what can help stimulate uh, a immediate, a immediate and high magnitude reduction in oil consumption in transportation. So that brings us to. Autonomous vehicles. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm assuming people. I'm, I'm assuming all you are familiar with the idea of autonomous vehicles. Know that Google has been testing these vehicles now since 2009. So for seven years, you know they've logged 1.5 million miles. At this point, just about every major automaker has announced a research program. Many of them are testing electric uh, autonomous vehicles on test tracks. Apple is involved in creating autonomous vehicle software. They. They haven't fully unveiled, uh, taken off the veil of secrecy off their project, but, but um, they become more and more transparent about it. Uh, Tesla has an autopilot, which is really not an autonomous car. And, and uh, you know, that's been in the news lately because of, uh, of a fatal crash that's happened while cars are in autopilot mode. Now, so a lot's been happening on the technology front. And I'm not really going to talk about what's happening on the technology front, but I'll talk a little bit more about what's happening on the policy front. So what's happened in what's happened? What's why this is important is really autonomous vehicles, uh, as seen to if they're going to achieve their full potential, represent the integration of several different aspects of vehicle technology. And already for years there have been a lot of work around connectivity, around making cars be able to communicate either with the cloud or with each other, and. And that enables you to have a system that communicates and more and perhaps better matches supplies and demand, so you can get intelligent. You can get intelligent highways that tell you that adjust tolls based on uh, based on how many people are driving, or ways can tell you what the most efficient route is. And th these all help in terms of efficiency. And I think what, what this gets really really powerful when you start to combine it with autonomous vehicles. And really, our vision we'll talk about, we'll talk about in a minute is to have autonomous shared electric vehicles. And we think actually economics propels you in that direction. So to understand why that's so, I'll begin a little bit with, um, with, a, with a, a, a graphic that uh, my nephew made for me for, for a school project. 
And uh, yeah, so, so <laughs> if you're looking for graphic designers. Um, so this basically gets us to, I think, the key problem that autonomous vehicles can address. And that is the extreme inefficiency of today's vehicle fleet. And vehicle, so the US is at, at a total extreme in terms of what we call motorization. There is almost every a car for every individual. There's about 250 million cars in the US, slightly over 300 million people. And most of those cars, at any given time, are sitting around unused. So um, on average, a car is used about 4% at a time. Utilization maybe gets to 10%, 10 to 15% during peak hours in certain cities. And that means that your car is, has, the average car has a 4% utilization rate. That is incredibly low. That means uh, this very valuable capital asset is sitting around unused most of the time. And not only that, but when the car actually moves, the median car trip in the US has just a driver in it. And the average is about 1.6 passengers. So there's a lot of unused seats in every single car. And then when you take into account inefficiencies in the motor and you totally, you, you, the inefficient and uh, uh, heat loss to thermodynamics, you basically get the number and the weight of the car because of all the safety features you put in. It turns out that well under 1% of the energy in a tank of gas is used for the kinetic energy of the passenger who needs to be moved. So taken up, so basically that's the number you really need to start to move forward. And uh, so you need to go from like 1% of the energy being used to, to move the passenger to to something higher than that. And the way to do that is increase utilization of cars and maybe decrease the size if you can better match the supply and demand. So I think, well, let me talk a little bit about the idea of electric, electric share driverless cars. So uh, this is a triangle that of mutually reinforcing ideas. So the, the part of the reason why cars are barely used today is because it's very hard to coordinate the sharing of cars. If you own a car, if you live out in the suburbs and you're going to use a car to commute to work and back, you're not going to be able to share that with someone because so the car is going to sit in the parking lot while you're at work or during the day. It's going to sit in your garage when you're there at night. But if you have a car that's autonomous, it can reposition itself and better match supply and demand. And if you're able to layer on that a piece of software that dynamically matches supply and demand, you're able to, you're able to better coordinate the, share, the sharing of vehicles. That, in turn, will drive up the amount of usage of vehicles because if a vehicle goes from 4% utilization and 10,000 miles a year to 50% utilization and 100,000 miles a year, that really shifts the economics of what you want in a vehicle. When a vehicle only drives a few miles a year, you start to be interested in the capital cost of a vehicle. And uh, uh, right today, a gas car, a gas-powered car, is cheaper than an electric-powered car. And therefore, people who make rational or somewhat rational economic decisions tend to buy gas-powered cars. When you move towards fleets of driverless cars that dynamically meet demand, one, when a car drives 100,000 miles a year, the operating costs become far more important. And as we showed before, the f cheapest fuel available for our cars today is electric. So we think this fundamentally shifts the, the, economics of, the economics of driverless vehicles towards, the, the economics of vehicles towards electric. And we have some modeling results that back this up. And by the way, I'm very happy to take any questions if anyone has any. So that's, it's, it's, it's a discussion. So um, please ask any questions at any time. So I think the and ride sharing, it turns out that ride sharing is the most important application in urban areas. And what's really interesting about autonomous vehicle development is even though it's the easiest place to deploy autonomous vehicles is on a highway, highways are a relatively controlled environment, uh, relatively few factors. Uh, most of highway driving is stay in your lane and don't crash into the vehicle in front of you. And that's what the Tesla autopilot and similar packages in other vehicles try to do today. Uh, most of the autonomous vehicle de development and testing and what we're seeing in terms of early stage deployment that we're working on tends to concentrate in urban areas. And urban areas are, because of scale, are really interesting labs for getting people out of their vehicles to give up their personal cars, or if, if they'd like to. And uh, we, we, we believe in market solutions and not imposed, imposed uh, um, 
impose solutions. So, but if there's a, the in, but uh, we already see this graph shows us how many households own a certain number of their cars. And it turns out in the U.S., the most common modality of ownership for outside of urban areas is two cars per family, with a sizable number of families having three three cars per family. And it's relatively uncommon outside of major urban areas for households to have no cars. But then when you get into dense areas, there is an increasing preponderance of households that don't own any cars. And that reflects the idea that in urban areas, there's alternatives for transportation, and that makes car ownership less likely. And therefore, there, it's, it's, there are synergies between working in urban areas and deploying autonomous pods that might uh, that might be able to transport one or two people at a time to between cities and having enough demand to scale up. So that's really where we think a lot of the a lot of the early stage autonomous deployment communities will center around. And uh, over time, over over time, it will spread out to a broader range of areas. This is a little bit dependent, so I put this graph out um, to talk about two different ways autonomous vehicles could be could could be deployed. One is I call the kind of the iterative autonomy development pathway. Uh, this is until recently what most car companies favored and thought the future would be. The way car companies work is they deploy new generations of technology in their vehicles every five to seven years. So the thought is today in the next generation you start to deploy what we call level two level two autonomy, which in which is in this, it goes in the scale of zero to four. Level two autonomy is not something you can ever trust to drive on its own, but the car has smart features, so it can autom do automatic emergency braking if it detects a car in front of it. It can do adaptive cruise control and adjust its speed to, to match the car in front of it. It can, do, it can stay in its lane because of cameras that can detect lane markings. So, um, so the next 10 years, we're going to deploy level two autonomy. Maybe then after that, we'll get to a conditional partial autonomy. And then over time, we eventually get to an uh, autonomous vehicle that can go anywhere at any time. And it turns out that this is, uh, this is a, th this makes a lot of sense if you're a car company, because you're assuming everyone's going to own their car and going to continue to own their car. And that's, and the only way to get to fully autonomous is to go through the partial the, the, this partial autonomous in-between zone. And it turns out that this is pretty difficult because as, as we saw with the recent Tesla crash, there is a muddy middle. There tends to be a really difficult human factors when you get to conditional autonomy. When you have a vehicle that's good enough that it can be autonomous and operate on its own most of the time, but still needs human supervision, it turns out that that is an extremely difficult place place to put the machine we call a human. People tend to need to be cognitively engaged to stay engaged, and you can't cognitively disengage and come back in. So it's really hard to say, stay, pay attention, the car will go by itself. Every once every 100 or 1,000 miles you'll need to intervene because it turns out the transition time for people to go from like playing on the, you know, texting or playing a game or watching a movie to being able to be fully engaged driver might be, uh, the research is still ongoing, but it might be 30 seconds or more. And at 60 miles an hour, a car goes half, half a mile in 30 seconds. And so there's almost, it's hard to, under, to, to conceive of engineering a system that can give you adequate warning to do that. So, uh, so that is par a big part of the reason why another approach has emerged, and that's the approach that, that we're seeing uh, not just from Google, but from several other smaller automakers and some of the large automakers as well. And that's the, you know, the autonomy first development pathway. So we can't have today, the, the technology is nowhere near ready to have an autonomous vehicle that can pick you up anywhere and drop you off anywhere. The, the robustness of the technology is not safe enough in many circumstances. However, there are certain circumstances in which you can imagine, and already you have today, uh, vehicles operating. So today, you have autonom some autonomous shuttles operating on closed campuses. So you know, we work with um, we work with someone who operates a, tr a large transportation company. He has several autonomous shuttles on nuclear power plants. So these are large, sprawling plants, but they're closed. There's limited traffic, and they have these shuttles running on fixed routes. And there's no driver in them. There's no steering wheel. It just makes predetermined stops. People get on. People get off. That's something we can do today. I think in the next couple of years. Uh, and really, I'm talking more like one to two years, you'll see the experimental deployments in geofenced 
urban areas where people want to, to want to use autonomous vehicles as taxis. Maybe at first they're going to have a driver in them as a backup and, and to have people um, and have people have a greater sense of security. But the idea is within certain areas where you can have a better understanding of the flow of traffic and you don't have to encounter the full range of conditions, you're able to have a, a vehicle autonomy and you start to gradually increase the range of conditions and the range of geographies in which you can have a fully autonomous vehicles and then at some point in the future you can get to autonomous everywhere at all times under any conditions. So I think this this um, this transition is so we, we, I think that increasingly uh, this is this is a the sort of pathway that we see uh, that we see autonomous vehicles following as they get to public deployment. Now we think this can happen really really quickly. This is a graph actually. This is taken from business expenses business expense reports from collected from Certify, uh, taken over a two year period. And you see that uh, this is just the yellow is just uh, the percentage of expenses that were exp of transportation expenses that were expensed to Uber. And you see they went from like nine nine percent and well under taxis and car rentals back in early 2014 to being today the biggest source of transportation related expenses claimed by business users. So the transition transportation is typically a very staid business where things happen slowly, and uh, all of a sudden this happened. This is happening very 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 quickly. I'll talk a little bit about why. So we're, what we do is we help organize political groups around building support for autonomous vehicles and, around, and, and then uh, imp using that support to help implement policies that will accelerate the adoption of autonomous vehicles. Let's talk about some of the groups that are not traditionally involved in transportation policy but are big, big voices on this issue. So this is a graph of uh, po U.S. population growth over time by age. So this age group, 16 to 65, will grow 15 percent, or projected to grow 15 percent over the next 50, 15 years. Um, whereas the 85 plus age group is, actually I think it's supposed to go out to 2050. So it's over the next 35 years. So, so over the next 35 years, the number of seniors going, a number of individuals above 85 years old supposed to triple. And the ones between 75 and 84 is going to double. And the U.S. population is graying. And look at the same time. This is the yellow line is the number of miles these people report traveling in a year. And as you can see, as soon as people hit 65, the transportation falls off a cliff. And a lot of that has to do with age-related infirmities. Some of it has to do with as you age, your, your need to, to drive seems to it's, it's fall off. You're no longer running carpool, and you're no, you may not, no longer be going to work and back. But a lot of it has to do with age-related infirmities. So we've had many interesting conversations with the elder community, groups like ARP, that talk about what autonomous vehicles could do for them and what their interest and interest in help pushing it forward can be. This is a plot of uh, employment labor for the disabilities community. And as you can see, something like the labor force participation rate for, all, for individuals without a disability in the U.S. is well over 80%. If you look at the labor pool participation rate for individuals with disabilities, it's about 40%. So we have this huge pool of people whose potential is untapped, whose ability to participate in life in our economy uh, is limited, and transportation lies at the root of a lot of that. So we've had the, the, this community has actually been extremely active in trying to push for sets of policies that will that will help uh, that will help autonomous vehicles uh, come forward and, and also come forward in a way that helps their community and, and it's actually surprisingly complex the disability community is quite large and different parts of the community have different interests or different slightly different takes in it for example the blind community is very focused on the UI and making sure that the UI of cars in general and autonomous vehicles once they come is accessible to individuals who are, are who are blind Whereas those who have ambulatory disabilities and are confined to a wheelchair are very interested in the shape of vehicles and making sure that they're wheelchair accessible. So there's a lot of work that goes to make sure that the group can that the group can work to, that the groups can work together and effectively advocate um, ad advocate for policies together. So um, let me talk a little bit about our modeling results. So we we work to build a dynamic equilibrium model with the with the, with an outside firm that specializes in it. And um, this shows, for example, what we think the vehicle, 
the U.S. vehicle composition will be in, or in, in 20, over the next 40 years, over the next uh, 25 years, assuming autonomous vehicles start to deploy in the early 2020s. So this is the business as usual scenario, uh, where the number of cars that people own goes up slightly, but in the world of autonomous vehicles, so we managed to get a lot of that transportation met by this little green sliver, which are these shared cars. So we project there'll be about 10 million shared cars that manage to, to take the, to meet about 30 to 40 percent of the mobility of people in the U.S. Whereas there still could be, I think we're a little bit conservative in this, but we think that there's still a huge place for both autonomous and non-autonomous personally owned vehicles. This causes a little bit of a rebound effect. This is the number of miles people drive. If you don't have autonomy, that stays relatively flat. It increases a little bit. But um, if you manage to add autonomous vehicles, it's easier for people to drive. Simple economics 101, you decrease the cost of a mile driven, whether both in terms of economic cost and in terms of the time of the cost of your time and the, and the ability to just get in a car without having to be the driver. That makes it easier, and therefore people purchase more of these goods, which are miles, and that goes up. That goes up quite, quite considerably. But we think this actually, on net, even with the added miles driven, this really helps U.S. energy security. And uh, the reason is because of this economic effect that I told you that we discussed before, where cars that drive a lot want to be electric because of the economics, because of technological synergies, and then also electric vehicles scale really well in terms of cost because the most important cost is the cost of the battery, which, which is a significant learning curve and, and, and uh, scale, scale cost, redu cost reduction through scaling. So of the shared vehicles, we project that all of them will be electric by 2040. Either the green is completely electric and the gray is a plug-in hybrid that runs off an electric battery but has a backup gas tank. Whereas the personal cars, the ones that are not shared but owned by individuals, will still have a significant proportion of gas and, hyb uh, gas and hybrid powered cars, but will be electric in pretty great proportion as well. And this is, should we show um, this is, this is, so, because a lot of the shared vehicles, even though they're a small in number, they do a lot of miles, uh, even though a significant portion of the fleet is still non-electric, we think the actual, if you look at actual miles traveled, a huge proportion of miles traveled, about 70% would be with electric vehicles, even though the fleet might be less than 70% electric vehicles, because we think the workhorses of the fleet, the shared vehicles that do a lot of mobility, uh, will, be, will be electric. And as you see, the fleet composition is about 50-50, or 50% you know, 50 uh, 50 electric, purely electric, and 50% hybrid slash gas. But uh, if you look at, in terms of miles traveled, the impact will be more than that. Um, so the, we graphed out, we talked, of, we graphed out what the oil dependency would be. So today we're sitting about 93% uh, petroleum dependent. And under a variety of scenarios, we uh, simulated what the oil dependency would be. And what we were particularly excited about is if you combine policies that enhance the adoption of autonomous vehicles with the actual, with the that widespread adoption of autonomous vehicles, we think we can get oil, oil reduction to about uh, oil reduction to oil oil dependency to about 43% uh, down from 93%. These are all the results of simulation. So, and as you as you well know, these are um, kind of conversation starters. But uh, we thought they were provocative enough to really lay a credible beginning to the policy to the policy side. So, let me talk a little bit. Actually, let me let me see if I can pull up um, our actual policy recommendations. So that we, in May, so let me talk for five minutes about our, our policy recommendations, what we think needs to be in place in order to uh, make autonomous vehicles get out there. And we are in conversation with many of the agencies. So th this policy takes place, policy discussion takes place on many different levels, whether the executive branch in the federal government, so the agencies like the Department of Transportation, which is going to come out with an announcement this summer uh, or early fall with a preliminary guidelines for autonomous vehicles with Congress, which has the ability to make new laws and to has 
Much harder to get a, a law passed in Congress, but Congress has broader powers than the executive branch. Executive branch, easier to get something done, but more limited set of powers. And then a lot of autonomous vehicle policy happens at the state level. At this point, about 35 states have either passed or considered autonomous vehicle related legislation. As I'm going to tell you in a second, we don't actually think that's a great idea. And then also local levels, because if autonomous vehicles are for hire, for hire and taxi regulations are done at the local levels. And that's actually one of the big challenges, coordinating coordinating um, action between all different levels. So in May, we released this report. We had a big event at the museum in DC. Um, you can go find YouTube videos online or read the report. Um, very, I think it's interesting. Um, and some of the key recommendations were, one is high level principle, make sure autonomous vehicles should be allowed once they're as safe as today's cars. Um, we shouldn't unnecessarily delay it because people are scared of something uh, irrationally and, therefore, and it, ha it brings tremendous benefits, not just in terms of safety, but in terms of uh, e economics, in terms of uh, access to mobility for underserved groups. So as soon as it's safe as today's vehicles, which is a big question about how you verify that, but once it's safe as today's vehicles, we think it should be allowed to, it should be allowed to, move, it should be allowed to go forward. Um, what's difficult about this is lots of states are passing laws about autonomous vehicles. They're not compatible. They often have very contradictory, almost arbitrary, uh, arbitrary rules that favor local interests. So, uh, in California, they're passing, they're passing, they're creating regulations that won't allow autonomous vehicle without a driver in it, and will for create certain ownership restrictions on autonomous vehicles and create a pretty difficult licensing process for them. Florida has permitted autonomous vehicles without a, without a steering wheel, without a driver in it. Uh, Michigan allows, past, is considering a law that will allow for the deployment of autonomous vehicle fleets to do mobility on demand, kind of like driverless Ubers, but only if you're a car company, not if you're a technology company. So, um, so these, this overlapping set of regulations, not only is it, listen, I think states, the states have the right to regulate industries as they see fit. There's a certain and very important, the idea of states' rights, very important to US principles of governance. However, there is a big national interest in not having different regulations in every state. So today, vehicle hardware is regulated on at the federal level because you can't have different requirements for windshield thickness in different states because then you'd have to have different vehicles in every state. So if you start to require, uh, have different requirements for autonomous vehicles in every single state, that could lead you down to the road where you, need, you might need 50 different autonomous vehicles for 50 different states. So we think a lot of the, the, a lot of the, the efforts should be led by the federal government, and that should set the standards. There needs to be updates in how we approach regulations. Today, a, a vehicle regulation is prescriptive. So you can look up something called the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards that has very detailed prescriptions for what every hardware piece of the vehicle should look like. That contrasts with the aviation industry. The avi aviation industry works on something called performance-based standards. So you might have to get something, you might have, your autopilot might have to be robust to a failure once every tenth of a six or once every tenth of a nine seconds. And there are performance standards for every piece uh, that goes into that. So as you start to move autonom towards autonomous vehicles, you need to maybe, you need to start to think about the regulatory framework that supports that. Also important to get the, 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 the technology out there. So really important, this is already starting. So they, the Columbus, Ohio won a $50 million grant from the United States Department of Transportation and to, to deploy smart transportation technology. Autonomous vehicles will be a part of that. Many other private efforts are going on. And these are really good, even if these are relatively small deployments and they're uh, shuttles that go in limited areas, it's really important to get the public exposed to this. Because one, as, as, uh, as, tech, as a technology vendor, I'm sure you understand that you learn when your customer, you have to see how your customers use the technology to learn how to update it and develop it. Regulators can't regulate a technology before it's used. That doesn't really work. And the public needs to gain trust in it. So there needs to be deployment communities where, we, that, where all those things can happen. Turns out there needs, there's a lot of concern from the car companies uh, around the liability. The, in the auto industry, there's a lot of lawsuits against car companies. They are often on the hook for, right, they're often on the hook for very large, very large bills, like 
uh, when Toyota has something like unintended accelerate the unintended acceleration because of their accelerator got stuck, that cost them billions of dollars. GM had a ignition st a switch failure, and that cost them billions of dollars. So. Uh, we are having some discussions around how you, you sh situate autonomous vehicles within the tort system not to, to make companies less risk averse and less, uh, less concerned about deploying it in the, in the face of what's sure to be a wave of lawsuits and making sure that doesn't stop the effort before it even starts. And we talked already about the importance of using, of uh, making sure that the technology is oriented towards underserved groups like seniors and individuals with disabilities. And I think that's, um, that's, that's th those are the high level recommendations. I think at this point, I know we have a couple of minutes left. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any or um, just uh, learn more about what you guys do. Sure. So let me repeat. Let me repeat the question. So it gets caught on the mic, and also make sure if I understand. So your question is, from a policy perspective, do you should uh, should the uh, should electric vehicles be, should autonomous vehicles be fuel agnostic? Like, is autonomy good whether we're talking about an electric drivetrain or a gas a gas powered drivetrain, or should the policy specifically try to specifically bias autonomous vehicles towards electric drivetrains? So there are policy groups that advocate for that. Uh, the, a group of environmental organizations recently sent a letter to, uh, to the office of the president saying that we should have policies that should force uh, autonomous vehicles to be electric. And I understand the rationale for that. As we saw, autonomous vehicles will increase the number of miles cars drive, and uh, therefore, therefore, um, and therefore, it will increase the pollution coming from those vehicles. So. Uh, my fe our feeling about that is, is there's many other factors at play. First of all, there's many other factors at play in terms of how uh, people make decisions around vehicles. And there is uh, personal ownership of vehicles is very important, to, very, impor very important to people from a psychological point of view. It's not necessarily tied completely to utility. And, and I think to be a successful, sustainable framework that people can come together on, I'd be concerned about being very prescriptive about exactly how people should use cars and whether and whether and forcing to say that you can only have an autonomous vehicle if it's electric. I think that would be a very divisive stance, and I think that wouldn't get, that would it would not only would be a divisive stance and therefore be difficult to get through. I actually think it would push back the to push back the benefits of autonomous vehicles. I think there's a really strong there are really strong reasons to believe that autonomous vehicles will be will be electric absent a bit hard policy push. And and therefore if you try to if you tie up the politics of autonomous vehicles with the politics of the environmental community, I think that could make it a more partisan issue and get it and, and get it tied up and and prevent the deployment of autonomous vehicles, which would prevent the deployment of electric vehicles. So I think you lose more than you win if you push to, for a policy like that. That said, there are important policy levers that I think can be used to help Im improve that. So um, one of the things we're starting to, re to really get geared up on is there, uh, just two weeks ago, the US released a draft of the next stage of its fuel efficiency standards. Cars are governed by fuel efficiency standards, and the current set of standards only go up to 2022. There's draft standards out to 2025, but they're not finalized yet. And the U.S. is in the middle; of, the government's in the middle of finalizing the 2022 to 2025 process. And these standards, they were originally conceived back in the 70s, and they're built upon a set of tests that were conceived of in the 70s, and by law, they're bound to it. So 
vehicles are scored based on their characteristic. Um, they go on basically treadmills for cars. The one's meant to simulate a city driving cycle, one's simula meant to simulate a highway driving cycle, and that's it. And I think that ignores the reality of the 21st century where a vehicle's contribution to fuel efficiency is not just about the characteristics of that vehicle, but how it's used as well. Like, I think an electric vehicle that's used as an Uber, and certainly as a driverless Uber that's driving around all day, does a lot more for fuel efficiency than an electric vehicle that's parked in someone's driveway. So I think if you manage to update the fuel, fuel efficiency regulations that can properly credit, then properly credit uh, cars for how they're used, that's like a win-win because it incentivizes the automakers to make, to, to make efficient cars that can be used autonomously. And it, uh, it's, a win for, and it's a win for the consumer because they get, they, they, in the end of the day, they also they get their choice. Great. Anything, any other questions?